Welcome to the Performance Around the Clock podcast. I am Professor Sachin Panda, a scientist in the field of circadian rhythm. In this podcast, I will talk to experts in many different fields about science, health, and human performance. You will also find out why circadian rhythm is my favorite topic. I hope you enjoy the podcast and thank you for listening. Welcome to another episode of Performance Around the Clock, and I'm super excited to have Christoph Sharman. Sorry, I butchered your last name. Fantastic. But <laughs> who who is a leading researcher in the emerging field of circadian immunology? Yes, there is circadian rhythm to immune function and immunity, and that's actually going to have a huge huge impact on almost every aspect of human health as it relates to treating disease and also recovery from many of the debilitating disease. So welcome Christoph and thank you for doing this. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually, you know, we all have our own way. Uh, We have different ways to get into this circadian rhythm field. And uh, what was your journey? How did you get into circadian and started thinking about timing of immunity? Yeah, pretty late, I need to say. (laughs) So I wasn't trained in a circadian lab. Yeah. And so I'm a bit, you know, I'm coming from the the side. Um, I did my PhD um, actually in vascular biology Mm -hmm. and leukocyte trafficking. That's where where I'm coming from. And then the molecule that we were investigating was also expressed in nerves and had also functioned there. It's an adhesion molecule. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, it, it helps leukocyte migrate, but also helps myelin sheath attached to peripheral nerves. So let, let's uh, um, dissect a few terms here. Vascular biology is blood vessels, and then you're looking at leukocytes, which are immune cells, how they move. It's not drug trafficking. It's actually how the cells yes. move through traffic inside the blood. Yeah. Like so we were that. talking about interactions between blood yeah. vessels and white blood cells. Yeah. And we were inter- and interactions between, you know, um, nerves and in sheathing cells that, that yeah, wrap yeah, around yeah, nerves yeah, in the yeah. periphery. Yeah. And so, um, and that molecule was, it was expressed in both, in both, um, uh, um, sites and had functions there. And so as my postdoc, I wanted to then combine leukocyte migration and neuroscience. So I was, so I'm coming basically, my interest is actually neuroimmunology. Yeah. And um, in the lab that I, I chose to, to go do my postdoc in, that was uh, the late Paul Frenette at yeah. uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, now uh, ICANN School of Medicine in New York. Um, in 2008, they, they published, which I think is a similar paper, um, where they showed that uh, hemotopic stem cells, so stem cells of the blood, mm-hmm. are being released in a circadian manner into uh, from the bone marrow into the blood. Yeah. And so he thought, Christoph, um, why don't you work on circadian oscillations yeah. in, you know, leukocyte migration? And so that was in 2008. That's the first time I heard about circadian oscillations. Oh, I see. So that was the, I remember that paper because yeah. uh, mm-hmm. um, around that time, I think we had another project in our lab showing that cryptochrome affect, sorry, cryptochrome modulate immune function, so circadian expression of cryptochrome yes. might uh, have some function with immune function. And then this trafficking paper came out showing how from bone marrow there's a circadian wave exactly. yeah. of cells being released. Yeah, and, so, and they stumbled into the field as well haphazardly because they realized that um, their normal functions in blood cells was, was somehow changed and they realized that in the animal facility, the light had been left on for two weeks. Yeah. And so that serendipitous finding then led to this nature paper. So I think oh, wow. following this up, <laughs> and they never knew what circadian rhythms were before either, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and then, and so basically through him, I came into the circadian field. Yeah. And I'm very, very happy that I did. Yeah. So, the, what was your first project after he asked you to? Um, so then we did some neuroimmunology, but in this case, um, I looked at um, adrenergic nerves in the periphery mm-hmm. and how uh, they regulate leukocyte migration in the periphery. Mm-hmm. And because the sympathetic nervous system is very, very rhythmic, um, that led to basically circadian nerves and uh, white blood cell trafficking. And so it's essentially the brain signal coming through the through adrenergic uh, exactly uh, system and then telling the roads or the blood vessels um, 
when to traffic this white blood cell. Exactly, and we knew it was nerves because we locally surgically denervated uh, nerves and, mm. and, and it wasn't some humoral factor that mediated this. Yeah. It was something local. Yeah. Wow. So that was, that was um, I also re vaguely remember that paper because, uh, you know, this adrenergic system is involved in so many different things and people always thought there might be uh, a different way that uh, the brain circadian clock might be regulating peripheral trafficking, but there was a beautiful paper showing how the sympathetic nervous system regulates trafficking. Yes. <laughs> peri peri. <laughs> yes, no, that was, uh, for me it was basically uh, it opened up a new uh, a door to a new world, right? Yeah. And so from then on, then um, when I, that was my postdoc, and then uh, I became PI in, in Germany. And then um, I looked at not um, uh, the, the circadian trafficking of cells of the innate uh, immune system, which is what I did during my postdoc, but then I looked at uh, um, circadian immune functions in cells of the adaptive yeah. immune system. So, yeah. can you tell a little bit about what is innate yeah. and what is adaptive? Yeah, so, so innate, uh, the innate immune system is something that reacts immediately to any kind of, you know, stimulus um, that the body's exposed to. And so, that, these would be cells such as um, neutrophils, and that's yeah. what I looked at, yeah. monocytes, macrophages. Yeah. And then you have a bridging cell yeah. uh, that, that, you know, bridges these very early signals with a longer term adaptive mm -hmm. uh, system. And these are the dendritic cells. Yeah. These are key players in presenting antigens, or for example, foreign particles to, um, to T cells. Yeah. And then at some point, the T cell response interacts with the B cell response to make antibodies, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And so then my thing was really to, um, to bring in uh, you know, adaptive immunity in the circadian part. Yeah. Yeah. Which of course, you know, I wasn't the first to do this, <laughs> but that was then you know, what I chose to study. <laughs> in my lab. Yeah. But that was a little, uh, you know, it's a little bit hard to think about being adaptive immunity being circadian because adaptive immunity is something that develops over time. For example, the best example is vaccination that we all are used to being almost everybody in the Western and modern world is exposed to. So um, you get injected with a small dose of the pathogen or some molecules, and then after several weeks, our body develops that immunity. So why do you think there's a circadian aspect? What time of the day you get vaccination will have the impact? Yeah, yeah. so I think that's the really the fascinating part about this long-term circadian immune response, right? Mm -hmm. So when we, we then published a paper that the trafficking of adaptive immune cells, so T and B cells, is also time of day dependent. And I think that was not that surprising mm -hmm. because we already knew this from other subsets. But I think what was surprising was something that then uh, Henrik Oster showed in which we could incorporate yeah. into our paper, um, namely that um, an adaptive immune response, so it was you know, an induction of multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. the animal model basically for multiple sclerosis, so a brain inflammatory disease, which you can induce in, in mice um, with pretty much a vaccination against yeah. the protein that's only expressed in the CNS. Yeah. And he showed, and we did this then together in our mm. paper, uh, that this then has um, a disease score, which um, depending on the time of day when you do this initiation, is, depend, is, uh, uh, is then bigger or smaller. Mm -hmm. And so that was amazing, I think. So you inject the protein or exactly. action like and then after how many weeks you are checking whether the mice have multiple sclerosis? So um, the, the protein is called MOG. Yeah. And you give this either, in this case, they did it at four different times, but in the end, we only chose to do it two different times in the afternoon or in the late night. And so after 10 days, then the disease develops. And then from that time point, you already see that there's a delta in disease score. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting was that... So what time gives you more severe disease? So in this case, the ZT8 basically, or afternoon time point gives you a stronger disease. I see. And I just want to follow this up because um, credit belongs to Henry Ghost on this, <laughs> because I wanted to do, we wanted to do the experiment, and then I, I saw um, his PhD student present the data, yeah. and then I, uh, I discussed with them, we have you know, all the data before and the yeah. mechanism, maybe we could you know, incorporate this, and yeah. so they, they, they agreed, and that I think it was, it was a fantastic collaboration. Yeah. So uh, what is the mechanism there? Is it trafficking that all the immune cells are coming together? And... So ultimately, um, we still don't understand why adaptive immunity is time of day dependent. Um, because like you said, you know, um, it, it takes so long for adaptive immune response to, to develop, right? 
um, much longer than a circadian day. So something probably very early on dictates this. Um, and so for an adaptive immune response to be really functional, you have about 10, to, to, to 10 days to, to 14 days. So I think what's happening, and you know, others and us could show that um, you know, lymph node oscillation exists, mm -hmm. and these you need for an adaptive immune response to, be, um, to become uh, functional. And so then upstream, you know, dendritic cells, this key interlinking cell between innate and adaptive immunity, um, these cells rhythmically go from where you induce the response to the lymph node. So we also have a trafficking component again. Mm -hmm. But probably something earlier than this is mm -hmm. probably what dictates this. And so some of these um, uh, questions we're trying to assess now to see what happens in the first hours yeah, okay. after you, in the periphery, you stimulate mm -hmm. something. And I probably... This probably then delineates the downstream response. Yeah. So we don't really understand yet yeah. how that works. So the bottom line, what you're saying is, suppose say I get a vaccination on my arm in the morning, and um, there are these dendritic cells that will take that particular antigen, what is what I'm getting vaccinated against, and they'll go to my lymph node, and then in the lymph node, many of this crosstalk will happen. And these dendritic cells, they have a specific time of the day, uh, they're more likely to go to lymph. That's correct. So yep. that means if you, if you, in simplistic term, if you deliver the message to the dendritic cells at a certain time, then there is a better likelihood that they would take the message within a reasonable time when the message is fresh <laughs> and then deliver it to the T cells and yes. B cells. But you are thinking there might be even earlier response, even the dendritic cells that are sitting next to my skin where my vaccination is, they may even have a clock that can sensitize them to this message of the vaccine. Uh, is that what you are going to look at? The... So, so I think the question is, or one of the questions yeah, yeah. is, you have, um, you're given uh, a vaccine yeah. and vaccines or other long, uh, like, um, you know, long existing um, uh, therapies that have long half lives. Basically, that vaccine sits there for some days yeah. and it drains locally That's antigen it. into mm -hmm. the muscle or the mm -hmm. tissue. So, and although you have this, you know, slow release antigen that's there for several days, the very first hours basically dictate mm -hmm. the circadian response, indicating that what happens downstream and the lymph node is probably not as relevant mm -hmm. for the circadian aspect as something that occurs very early on. Yeah, and so um, it may be that um, these dendritic cells can either migrate or not. And if you catch them at the wrong time point, they don't migrate. But you could argue that maybe then they just need to wait for a couple of hours and then they migrate. But probably then, you know, not all, only the quantity in the response probably is time of day dependent, but also the quality. Mm -hmm. And so probably then qualitatively something changes in the system mm -hmm. that once you touched it at the wrong time point is already it's yeah. already altered downstream. Yeah. So, I think that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, that's fascinating because there is always people always ask, is there a good time of the day when somebody should be vaccinated? And what is your opinion? I mean, so of course there is still I would say Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely there's best times. Yeah. And you should normally do this, you know before 12 p.m. for sure. I mean, I think the best data so far exists in, uh, in this data from uh, the JCI Insight study from uh, Jeffrey Haspel, yeah. where they looked retrospectively, not at how much antibody was made, how well the TSA response was, because in the end, you know, who cares, yeah. right? In the end, basically, it sees like, are you protected or not, right? Are you dead or alive? Or, oh, or, or, did, or you, did you, did you have COVID or not? Yeah. And so in this case, basically, they looked at uh, breakthrough infections. Yeah? yeah. So basically, you know, you can have a breakthrough infection. That means, you know, your vaccine didn't really cover you 100 percent. And so in this case, um, uh, most of these breakthrough infections occur when you were um, uh, vaccinated late. Yeah. So at 6 p.m., I think. Yeah. And, and the best basically uh, your best protected. I think it was between 10 and 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. Wow. And I think that's the best data because it yeah. has a functional relevance. Right. Yeah. Because otherwise, if you were to do this when you vaccinate, you would always have to challenge. Yeah. to see whether it really has an effect. Yeah. And so I think that's um, at least, uh, that probably has the fu best functional um, yeah. assessment so far. No, I think, uh, you know, COVID was terrible and it, it affected a lot of people. And unfortunately, a lot of people 
did not survive, but at least from scientific point of view, it also gave us opportunity to look at this kind of data where very well-defined group of people who had never received this COVID-19 vaccine got the vaccine. And then fortunately, Jeff could collect the timing of vaccination and then longitudinally over the next one or I think it was two years or something like that. I don't one remember exactly. Years, something. To be very honest. Yeah. It was definitely more than 12 months. Absolutely. You need yeah. to have a follow up for this, yeah. obviously. And then looked at that. Which and you need be... a big cohort of people, yeah. which you had 1.5 million people. So yes. that's big statistical <laughs> power behind it. That's yeah. when clinicians listen, right? Yeah. And uh, this would be almost impossible to do even for flu vaccine because there are a lot of people who get vaccinated almost every single year including me, <laughs> and, uh, and it will be difficult to follow them up and figure out whether you had flu or not. So Absolutely. I think um, you need to have an immune naive population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And so one of the things that we did also in a mouse model, um, we, we vaccinated them with a hepatitis A vaccine Yeah, because hepatitis A, normally you don't get vaccinated against yeah. and normally you don't have it yeah. if you, in the Western civilization. Yeah. And so uh, because we then wanted to follow this up yeah. with a vaccination study in human, yeah. But then before we got there, you know, COVID happened. So we couldn't follow up uh, just in a prospective trial. But I think this is something you need to do. I think a flu is probably not really clean. Yeah. You need to do something where you have really immune naive patients. Yeah. yeah. And also it's very difficult because um, those outcomes, breakthrough infection or breakthrough sickness might happen even many years later. So yeah. it'll be very difficult to capture them. And that's so, also something that we would then not uh, be able to assess, right? Yeah, that, because that. you just know, you know, let's say the T cell response, so the cellular response or mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. antibody response, but you don't know normally whether these people get sick or not. Right? Yeah. So there is another thing that always comes up from curious mind is, uh, you know, there are many times when we have side effects of vaccine. Like for example, you take a flu vaccine, sometimes some people get a flu-like symptom for one or two days. Is there any study that you might have seen that says timing of vaccination changes adverse side effect? If there is none, then that's okay. I'm sure they exist. I didn't really pay that much attention yeah. to this, but that's something we're looking at right now. Okay. And so right now, um, Others and us are looking into um, prospective cl clinical trials mm -hmm. to see whether in cancer patients, immunotherapy is time of day dependent. Because as you may know, um, there's now retrospective data indicating that so-called immune checkpoint inhibitors, so basically antibodies that would you know, release the breaks of T cells, that this um, uh, therapy is time of day dependent. Mm -hmm. And so often, you know, if you have a good response, this unfortunately also often comes with adverse events. Yeah. And so... Um, so let's uh, dial back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, immunotherapy and particularly checkpoint inhibitors. And then what kind of cancers are now treated with this type of cancer? So... Of medicine. So, um, so these immune checkpoint inhibitors, they are targeting um, these break molecules, if you want to call them. For example, PD-1 is one of these molecules. Yeah. And if you have an interaction with uh, the receptor and the ligand, then basically this T cell, you know, is not as effective. And so if you can interfere with that interaction, this negative interaction, basically the T cell becomes more effective. And there's different antibodies that target this in 2018 yeah. uh, that received the Nobel Prize in medicine. Yeah. And so, um, so this is basically the immune, immunotherapy that I, I'm talking about here. Um, so the immune cells go and kill the tumor. So that's why immuno... Exactly. So you release, in this case, you release the, um, the break. Of course, there's different types of immunotherapy. Yeah, this would yeah. be one. Yeah. So what is the circadian connection? I know that you just recently published this beautiful study. Thank you. And um, just simplify it for the general audience. Yeah. Maybe I can start with the retrospective clinical yeah. data because yeah. that, that came first. So in 2021, Zach Bufeld, who's also here at this conference, mm -hmm. Uh, published, um, I think, a super cool study where they did retrospectively um, uh, a very controlled analysis of melanoma patients who received um, check these checkpoint inhibitors at different times of day. And they sh found that if most of these infusions were done um, earlier during the day, they had a better overall survival, which is a very, very tough readout, overall yeah. survival. Yeah. Yeah. And if, they, um, if they, they, uh, the patients received these infusions later during the day, 
uh, they had worse survival. Um, and so, um, based so, yeah. So for this melanoma now, how many times they have to get this infusion? <laughs> yeah, you are already getting into the the details here, and maybe that's maybe then that's the mechanism which maybe we can discuss then. I see. But um, so they normally get initially four cycles. I see. And um, after those four cycles, then um, they get many more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, the, the longer they survive, obviously, they also the more cycles they have. Yeah. So often, you know, the number of cycles is already a predictor of, you know, yeah. how good the, the patient survives. But um, there's some, you know, maybe some evidence indicating that maybe the first cycles, timing mm -hmm. of the first cycle is, is, is important. And so now you're talking about this paper that we, that we published. Um, in our hands, in a mouse model, um, what we initiated, we, did, we, we do this now in more detail, but in this mouse model it indicates that um, the timing of the first dose may be more important mm -hmm. than the timing of the following dose. Of course we didn't do this as in the clinic with many, many, many doses. Yeah. And you could imagine that maybe the first dose matters, that, but if you wait long enough, mm -hmm. maybe then the rhythm or the system becomes again sensitive to, to circadian intervention. Yeah. So it may matter actually, you know, how long the interval is. So in humans, how how long is the interval between the first cycle, the first infusion, and the second infusion? So normally, for example, for melanoma, it's between two to four weeks, so normally okay. three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so I think, and that's probably the same with vaccinations. Mm -hmm. um, the first dose matters, or the time yeah. of the first dose, but then if the interval is long enough, probably the second dose also matters. And that was shown. Yeah. There, there's some papers that indicate exactly that, that the delta initially you have time mm -hmm. of day differences, but then this is augmented with the second dose. Oh, I, see. I think if you look at all the published stories, there's mm -hmm. some stories that don't really agree with this, but I think you need to look at the area under the curve yeah, yeah, to, yeah. To, to see what, you know, where the field is, what, what, is, what is correct, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think uh, the same goes also now with this, um, with these antibodies. Yeah. You know, with this uh, against these checkpoint inhibitors. Um, that I think now there's maybe 1,200 patients that were retrospectively analyzed, and mm -hmm. they also, en gros, go into the same direction that early infusion time seems to be better overall yeah. for the patient. Mm -hmm. So this is a big thing because uh, many of the immunotherapies, the at least for some some types of cancer, the efficacy is. 20%, 25%. Of course, for melanoma, it's pretty high, right? Um, but for, say, head and neck cancer and then few others, it's like 20%. So that means one in five who is getting the therapy is actually benefiting. And if we increase that efficacy to even one in four, that itself, even though it looks like only 5% increase, that means we are actually going to save thousands of lives by just changing one thing, what time? the therapy is given. I, I think this is a big thing. I think the, and this, for me at least, the first time that I see that I see a clinician that I talk to really thinking that this could be important, right? Yeah. Although they do tell me, Christoph, you know, this is all retrospective, you know, we need a randomized, ideally yeah. several, yeah. multi-center, you yeah. know, randomized clinical prospective trial trials. And this is what's happening, yeah. I think, right now. So I think in the next five years, we will have this data Mm -hmm. And I'd be very surprised if you wouldn't see a time of day difference. Is there now randomized multi-location trial going? So there's, um, from what I understand, there's one trial right now in China that's under under uh, underway, and I think there's several that will be uh, starting later this year. Yeah. No, that's exciting. I think it's super one. exciting. Yeah. yeah, because that's going to change a lot of clinical practice if we can so in randomized control trial. Yes. Uh, even if the fit size is five percent, that means thousands of people getting cured. Well, I think maybe in some cases you don't see the effect because you infuse at the wrong time. And so, for example, when we did this in, in mice, mm -hmm. um, we saw that, you know, the wrong timed infusion had no effect whatsoever, zero. Yeah. And so you only saw the effect at the right time, indicating that the full change is infinite. Yeah. Because there's no effect basically at the wrong yeah. time. Yeah. And so if this is the case, um, you know, then, then, the, if, then the effect size could be relatively strong. Yeah. yeah. So this is uh, immunotherapy is one type of therapy that uses the immune system. CAR T is another type of therapy. 
And can you tell us a little bit what is CAR T therapy and then whether there is a circadian aspect to CAR T? Yeah, so there's another immunotherapy, right? Yeah. Because it, it yields or it wields the, the immune system as a tool to target cancer. And I think right now it's probably, these, probably, these therapies are the most targeted in it. And, uh, yeah. And obviously, I'm coming from that part, so I'm very excited about this. So, so CAR T cell therapies or general adoptive T cell therapies are, are using T cells that are you know, specific for the tumor. Yeah. And then they're being infused into the patient to help the patient's immune system uh, get rid of the tumor. And so you can do this with, um, with you know, uh, adoptive T cells that are just harvested and proliferated and, and re-injected back into the patient. Or you can do this with... Um, with cells that are modified mm -hmm. and um, express this uh, chimeric antigen receptor, the CAR, mm -hmm. on the T cell that can be uh, targeted against any any surface antigen that you want. Yeah. And so um, what we what we found in, in, in this paper was that we alluded earlier yeah. to this oscillation in leukocyte trafficking. And um, what what we found is that similar to this um, uh, checkpoint inhibition therapy. Also here, we find that if you inject these cells at the right time, mm -hmm. they reach the tumor much more numerously, yeah. and then they're also more effective in, in killing the tumor. Because that has been a big challenge for CAR T cells, that they may not infiltrate the tumor, so that's why they cannot kill the tumor. So if you can make these T cells go into the tumor, that's a huge step. That's big. <laughs> so, so what we did was yeah. we we gave a melanoma, which is a yeah. solid tumor, but where CAR T cell normally is not being used right now. Mm -hmm. And um, we, um, we injected a, um, a lymphoma where CAR T cell therapy is currently being used subcutaneously to make a solid tumor out of it, right? Yeah. So we, we played a little bit with the model, right? But um, what we're doing right now is to really see whether in a solid tumor model, yeah, in a really relevant solid tumor model, mm -hmm. um, you have higher infiltration rates. And I, I think that would be the case, yeah. Yeah. No, that, when you give it intravenously, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because there are now even many uh, cancers that are not treatable by immunotherapy, like pancreatic cancer. Um, so this will open up a huge area, not only for the established cancer therapy where the efficacy is 20% and we are thinking of increasing by 5 to 10%, where there is zero efficacy. And if we can go from zero to 10, zero to 20, that would be huge. I think the patients who are, you know, yeah. affected by this would be, would be uh, very, yeah. very happy indeed. Are you working on any of those areas where the tumors are not currently amenable to immunotherapy? So in general, we try to, um, you know, um, use a therapy that we know works and then adapt it to different tumors, but we don't really work on a specific tumor type. I see. So we work on the therapy as a, uh, like, as a whole. Um, what we do is to, um, to combine these therapies also, mm -hmm. and that's what we did already. So for example, if you infuse antibodies, this, these checkpoint inhibitors, uh, at one time point, and at the same time point, then you also give you know these CAR T cells at the same time. Yeah. You actually can maximize the effect, so you have two mm -hmm. circadian effects, and you together basically you have an even bigger effect. And yeah. so that seems to be working. Yeah. So this was all done in mice. Absolutely. Any plan to do it in humans? Combining two different. Yeah. So therapies? this, I mean, so first I think <laughs> we need to have uh, the monotherapy, right, yeah. which is the prospective clinical trial that other people are running. Yeah. Um, but what we're doing right now is to look at the mechanism to see, you know, how these time of day effects are actually come about. Yeah, and that's yeah. what we're doing in human as well. Yeah. Yeah. But all of these they depend on time of day. But one of the complaints you'll hear from hospitals is it's very logistically challenging, because if everybody lines up to get the therapy in the morning, then it will be almost impossible to accommodate so many patients. So, is there any approach you see? that will take the timing component, timing of scheduling component away, but you can still use circadian wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think people are working on this, right? Yeah. And so we also are, right? I mean, for example, if you could, you know, make uh, the patient's time not as relevant yeah. as, um, as your drug, right? Yeah. Uh, then obviously you would you would uh, advance this, and then clinicians would be much more excited, you know, than, than yeah. changing their daily life. Yeah. 
Um, and so um, you, you could maybe try to locally change timing yeah. and then you vaccinate yeah. in this locally changed environment. Mm -hmm. Who knows if that works? Yeah. Um, or you, you, you create a timed drug somehow, right? Yeah. Um, and so some of these things we're working on. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, uh, if you then combine this with maybe a patient's time, yeah. and so you have, you know, you know, one component and the other component that are both in phase yeah. and are maximal, then you probably can maximize and optimize the response, I would say, yeah. Yeah, no, I always think of this, um, you know, in future, I would like to see an integrated uh, device uh, that will monitor my own timing, circadian timing, whether it's uh, timing in blood pressure or uh, skin temperature or activity, whatever time. And then that's coupled to a drug pump and that would determine what is the optimum time and then infuse that. Because if you think about it, all of these components are out there. There are sensors that are continuously measuring. For example, many uh, wearable devices are continuously measuring. They can give us circadian timing. And in fact, in circadian rhythm research, we use those wearables. Now on the other side, we have type one diabetes management where there is insulin infusion system linked to glucose sensing. So now instead of infusing insulin, if you can put the chemo or some of the immunotherapy or XYZ, any other drug that is dependent on time, then you can essentially come up with a system that will monitor circadian timing, time the drug and also put it at the right dose. Uh, <laughs> so that's my dream. No, I and think hopefully that will start with cancer treatment. I think that's great. And so far we haven't even looked at the internal time yeah, yeah. that much, right? I mean, we looked at time of day, and so far we don't know in our setting, you know, what, what is the effect of the internal time versus the time of day and mm -hmm. and, and how much this overlaps. So that's another thing we, we should be doing, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christoph. This is exciting. I mean, you are the really the bleeding edge of taking circadian rhythm to treatment from anything from vaccination, boosting our immunity against disease to curing some of the very incurable disease like cancer. And I hope to talk to you again next year and hopefully there will be another paper showing how to make this even simpler. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Sachin. I need to say this is obviously a group effort, right? And groups effort, yeah. right? So we're one of, of many groups that are looking at this, right? And no, I, so guess, I think yeah. the field in general yeah, I think it's very excited. Yeah, and we're just one of the groups that are, you know, fortunate enough, I think, to be at this right time there, because I feel that this field is, this 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 immunology field is 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 moving towards time of day. No, I guess you are. You know, um, people say um, you have to be lucky, but I guess what is important is to be opportunistic and putting together a team like you have done so far. Um, within your own group and also collaborating, like you, many names you mentioned here, Henry Koster and a few other people, bringing them together to ask this very important question. Thank you, Christoph, and Thank you, hopefully we'll meet, we'll meet again.